Welcome to section four of the Complete Web Developer course. With CSS and HTML under your belt, you can now build and style the content of pretty much any website you want. Well done. In this section, we're going to start learning JavaScript. JavaScript is our first real coding language. And here's a fact for you. In 2022, 98% of websites use JavaScript on the client side. We're web developers, so JavaScript is something we definitely want to master. For the websites we're building, we want users to click and interact with our content, and it's JavaScript that's going to let us do that. It's at this point that we move from a good-looking but static website to a good-looking and interactive website. It's more fun for you, and it's more fun for your users. So have fun with JavaScript, and I'll see you at the beginning of the next section. So welcome to the JavaScript section of the Complete Web Developer course. It's a reminder that everything that we've done so far has been focused on layout and design and style. Other than a very little bit of interaction with forms, we haven't been able to make our websites do anything. And that's what JavaScript is all about. It allows you to make your websites interactive, which will make the user experience a lot better and allow you to create things like games, apps, and web apps that hopefully your users will love. It's also our first look at proper coding. What I mean by that is we can start making software and programs that do something rather than just look a certain way. So it's a big move, a big shift, a lot to learn, but also really exciting. I'm going to just show you very quickly how easy it is to get started with a little bit of JavaScript. And we'll do this in the usual way. And I'm going to create a new folder. Which I'm going to call three JavaScript and then I'll just call it javascript.html and that's the main file that we'll be working with. There we go. And then go back to the start. So we'll change the title to JavaScript. Okay, so very quick challenge for you. Can you make this new page appear in your browser? You should be a master of that by now. All right, hope you managed it. All we need to do is update the URL to 3-JavaScript. and then javascript.html. There we go, blank page, but you can see the title up there. All right, so I'm going to show you a very simple way to get a little bit of JavaScript up and running. And we're going to use a button. So it's much like a submit button that we saw in the forms section of the HTML chapter. But by default, it doesn't do anything. You have to give it some code to make it do something. So let's tempt our user by putting the words click me into the button. Let's have a look. There's our button. So we click it and of course nothing happens. So how do we add our JavaScript? Well, just like with CSS, there's three different ways that we can put JavaScript into our websites. And they're exactly the same three different ways as with CSS. 
So the first that I'm going to show you is the simplest, but not the one I'd recommend long term, but it will get us started. So this is inline JavaScript. And instead of, you remember, we used style before to get some CSS, we use on click to get some JavaScript. So this just means that we're going to execute this bit of JavaScript when the button is clicked. Simple as that. And then we put the JavaScript that we're going to execute into these quotes. And a nice simple command is alert. And then we have some parentheses or brackets. And in single quotes, I'm going to put hi. So slightly complicated, but you'll get the idea, hopefully. So this command means alert. And then we have some brackets to contain the instructions about what we want to alert. And in single quotes there, I've put the word hi with an exclamation mark. So this should alert the word hi. What exactly does that mean? Let's run it and find out. There it is. So we get a little pop-up that says hi. So feel free to experiment with that a little bit. You can essentially put any text you like there or numbers or anything else and it will appear when the button is clicked. So that's your first teensy bit of JavaScript and a little bit of interaction between your user and your website. In the next video, we'll switch from inline to internal JavaScript, which is going to be a move very similar to the one that we made when we did CSS in the previous chapter. All right, so you've now written your first bit of JavaScript, and this is, as I've mentioned, inline JavaScript, which is a very easy way to get it up and running, but not generally the way I'd recommend doing it. For exactly the same reasons we avoided inline CSS, it's just very messy. Just in the same way that we want to keep our style and our content different, we want to keep our logic or our code or our JavaScript different from our content as well. So the way we do that, is very similar to how we put in our style. We just use script. There we go. And any JavaScript that we put in here will then be executed as soon as the page loads. Now that will work in itself, but it's considered correct to put the correct type just to make it really clear that this is JavaScript that we want the browser to execute. So very quick challenge for you then. Can you write a little bit of JavaScript here to pop up the pages loaded or something similar once you reload the page? Go for it. Did you manage it? The challenge was possibly you might have included the on click command. And if you did, no worries. But the JavaScript itself is actually just the alert part and then whatever text you want inside the quotes there. So that's it. That's all you needed. Let's just save that and refresh the page. So you can see I just did a refresh there. I didn't click the button, but that JavaScript was executed. A quick note about single and double quotes. I used single quotes here because we had double quotes around the edge of the on click attribute. So if I'd used double quotes in there, that would have got very confused because the system would have thought that this double quote was supposed to end this bit of text rather than start a new one. So if you want to have quotes within quotes, as we've got here, then you need to use double and single. But here, we don't have quotes within quotes, so you can use double or single. And double is slightly more conventionally correct these days, even though both will work exactly the same. Single is only really used when we have to use it. If we're just using some quotes, double quotes is the standard. While we're here as well, just like CSS, JavaScript has an optional semicolon at the end. You don't need it, but you can put it there and that will enable you to put several different commands on one line if you want to. So I'd recommend getting into the habit of putting semicolons at the end of your lines.
but it's up to you. One more thing I want to show you while we're here is the Chrome console, which is really handy for debugging your JavaScript. So let's go back to, I just right clicked or control clicked on the page and click inspect, like you may have done a few times if you followed along the BBC CSS project with me. And then if we go over and click console, so the console gives you two powerful tools. First off, you can actually write JavaScript straight into it. So alert, hello, is there one bit of JavaScript that we know? And then that then is actually run on that page itself. So that can be really handy if you want to check a particular command. But probably more usefully is it will show you if you've got errors in your JavaScript. So if I make a mistake and instead of alert, I type alert, then first off, if I run the page, let's just get rid of the console. If I run the page, notice nothing happens. I don't get an error message or anything, just nothing happens. And that's what will happen. If there's an error in your script, you won't get an error message on the page itself. It just won't do anything. And that can be really frustrating. But if we have a look in the console, you can see we've got a lovely error message there. Ert is not defined. So we're trying to use a command that doesn't exist. So I have no doubt that while you're making pages and practicing with JavaScript, you'll make mistakes and you'll have errors in your code. And the Chrome console is a really good way to see what they are. It even tells you what line your error is at. And then you should be able to see straight away, aha, yes, of course, I've just spelt that wrong. And then you run it again, your error disappears and your code works. So I'd recommend using that and I'll definitely refer to it throughout the course as well. Notice that you can put your script code up in the head there. And in some situations, that's a good idea. And we'll see some of those later on in this section. But generally, for the first section at least, we're going to be primarily putting our code at the end of the page like that. And that means that it will get executed as soon as the page is run. And which for most of these examples, that's what we want. All right, so enough introduction. Let's get started and start writing some real JavaScript. All right, so now that we've seen how to run some JavaScript in an internal way, we're going to see how we can start interacting with elements on the page. But at the moment, all we're doing is alerting something. So that's a pop-up which tells the user something. But very often, of course, what we want is for our code to affect something that appears on the screen itself. So let's get rid of our button and type in anything we like. So I'll go back to the good old standard hello world. And then let's just run that and make sure that that's updated. There we go. And of course we get our pop up as well. So what if we wanted using JavaScript to update the contents of this paragraph tag and change the text to something else? That's a basic example of something we might want to do in a real life page. For example, if we've got a login form and someone clicks the login button without having entered their details, it would be a useful thing to show them a message to tell them to enter their details. And this is how we would do that. So let's get rid of our alert instruction, and see how we access this element here. Now, as you may remember, the classes and IDs that we used in CSS, I mentioned can also be used in JavaScript. And IDs in particular are very powerful because the thing about IDs is they refer uniquely to an element. So it's very easy in JavaScript to get an element by its ID. So let's give this paragraph text an ID of text. And now let's find out the JavaScript for selecting that and doing something with it. So we start off by typing the keyword document. So document tells the JavaScript that we're going to be looking for something inside this document. Makes sense. And then we use a dot to go within the document. And then we want to get an element by its ID, which does exactly what it says on the tin. It gets an element by its ID. Notice also the capitalization here, because we're going to be using this throughout our use of JavaScript. This is common to many programming languages where we start with a small letter and then each word 
in the function name to the first letter capitalized. So we've got get is all small, element begins with a capital E, by with a capital B, and ID with a capital I. So that's just quite a nice way of making it readable without putting in spaces or hyphens or anything nasty like that. All right, so this instruction will get an element by its ID. We need to tell it the ID of the element that we want. So we put in brackets, and you can see my text editor here is telling me that we need a string, which isn't the ID. So a string is just a bunch of characters. So it goes in double quotes as we're used to, and then we just put in the ID. So this will now get the element text by its ID. So we've now got the element that we want to change. How do we change it? Well, we add another dot, and then we use the instruction inner HTML. And this gets, as you might imagine, the inner HTML of this element with ID of text. And we want to change that to something else. So we set it equal to, and then whatever string we want. So maybe I want to change it to hello Rob, rather than hello world. And that's our full instruction. So there's quite a lot of new stuff in there. So take a moment to just go back and make sure you understand what each of those bits are doing. I'm going to just quickly recap it for you. Document means that we're going to get something within the document that we're working in. So that's this whole HTML document here. And then get element by ID says that we want to get an element within the document by its ID. Then we pass the ID that we're interested in, which is text. And then we want to get the inner HTML of that element, which at the moment is hello world. And then we want to set it equal to something else, i.e. in this case, hello Rob. That's it. And remember, we've got an optional semicolon. And I'd recommend putting semicolons at the end, but it will work without them. All right, let's have a look. So if we now save that and run it, you can see we've got hello Rob right there. So it might not look that exciting, but with what we've managed to do there is actually change the content of our page using JavaScript. So that's a really powerful thing to be able to do. One quick thing to show you before we move on is comments within JavaScript. And this can be very useful as you're writing your code to leave comments to remind yourself later on what your code is actually doing. Or if someone else is going to be editing your script or looking at your code, it can be very useful to them as well. So there's a couple of ways to add comments in JavaScript, and they're common to pretty much every programming language out there, which is great. So if you want to have a one line comment, you add a double forward slash there. And then if we just run that again, it's no different at all. It still works. We still get hello, Rob, but obviously the comment doesn't do anything. So you can write whatever text you like there. Secondly, if you want to add a multi-line comment, you do a slash and then a star to begin the multi-line comment. And you can see that this is now commented out this part here as well, which we don't want. So we have to end the multi-line comment and we do that with a star and a slash. So now we can put whatever we like in between those two and it will be considered a comment. It won't be processed with the code. So we put something like this is a multi-line comment. And we can put whatever we like in there, as many lines as we want. So just to check, once again, its code still works. We haven't broken anything. All right. So that's how you do both one-line and multi-line comments in JavaScript, and it's also how we change the content of our page using JavaScript. Of course, doing that on the page load is not necessarily that exciting because we can't actually see it happen because it happens so fast, we never see the hello world. So in the next video, we'll see how we can use buttons to process JavaScript on demand, i.e. when the button is pressed. So now that we know how to change the content of a web page using HTML, we're going to attempt to do that using a button. So rather than updating it as soon as the page is loaded, we're going to have a button, and then when that button is pressed, that's when we'll update the inner HTML. And that, of course, starts adding some genuine interactivity with our pages rather than just running some code as soon as the page is run. So try and remember this. 
I'm going to get rid of it now, but you're going to need to type it in a challenge that I give you in a minute. So try and have that in your mind. What I'm going to do is after the hello world paragraph, I'm going to add in a button which is going to have the words change text. There we go. And this is the button that we're going to press to update the text here. Obviously it doesn't do anything yet. But in order to refer to it in our JavaScript, we're going to give it an ID just as before. So we can call this whatever we like. I'll call it my button. All right. So that's all we need on the HTML side. Here comes the first mini challenge then. Can you select the button by its ID? So just in the same way that we did in the previous video, when we selected the text paragraph, can you select the button by its ID in JavaScript? Go for it. All right, hope you remembered how to do it. You should have started with document to say that we want to get something within this document and then get element by ID. That's the key command that we need in this case. And then, of course, the ID is my button. There we go. So that's what you should have come up with. You didn't need the inner HTML because all we wanted to do was select the button and we've done that now. So how do we then connect some JavaScript to this button? Well, we don't want to change the inner HTML of the button, but what we do want to do is add an on click. So we do that using dot on click. And this is effectively the same as writing an on click instruction right there as we did a couple of videos ago. But it's much cleaner because we're using internal JavaScript rather than inline. So what we're doing here now is we're setting a function that we want to happen when the button is clicked. So to set that function, we use equals, and then we want to create a function. Now, when we define a function, we always have a pair of parentheses or brackets after it. Quite often, these might have some variable names in it if we're going to pass some variables to this function. But we're not doing that in this case. So really don't worry too much about those parentheses. Really think of them as things that have to come after functions. We'll see them in a lot more detail in just the next few videos. So now we've set it equal to a function. We need to define what that function is. And to do that, we use our curly brackets like that. So what this is essentially saying is when my button is clicked, do whatever code I write in here. So quick challenge number two, can you make it so that when the button is clicked, instead of changing the text, it alerts button clicked. So when the button is clicked, it alerts button clicked. Go for it. Okay, I hope you remembered how to do that. Very simple, just alert and then brackets because this is a function. And then we want to pass a string to the alert function. The string is just a collection of characters, which in this case we want to say button clicked. And then let's pop our semicolon at the end. All right, let's have a look. So now refresh and there we go. Button is clicked. So that's our first bit of genuine interaction with our page using JavaScript. We've run some JavaScript when the button was clicked. That's all well and good, but what we really want to do when this button is clicked is change the text. So this is where you need to remember what we did in the previous video. So can you write the code that will update hello world to hello Rob or hello whatever your name is or whatever text you like? Go for it. Did you manage it? I hope so. We should have started off with document to say that we want to select something within this document. Then get element by ID because we want to select an element by its ID. And then the element that we want to select is the one with the ID of text. And then we want to set the inner HTML of this element equal to whatever we like. 
So I'm going to change it to hello, Rob, just as we had before. Finish it off with a semicolon. That's it. So that's exactly the same as the code that we had in the previous video. So let's save that and fingers crossed, it'll all work. Hurrah! Fantastic. So that's some really genuine interactivity because we're updating our web page based on the actions of our user. As a very quick aside here, I'm just going to remind you of the Chrome console, which you get by right clicking or control clicking and then inspect the page and then clicking console. Because as you start doing more of these challenges, you'll start to get code that just doesn't do anything. Because remember, when you have an error in JavaScript, it won't show you the error on the page. It just won't do anything. So had you mistyped and typed document by mistake, then had you run it, nothing would happen on the page to tell you that you had an error, but it wouldn't work. And then here in the console is where you'll see the error. So line 21, something about document. Ah, there we go. There's the error document. Much better. Save, refresh, click the button, all is well. So if you find yourself getting errors during the challenges, then remember to look at the console to see exactly what the error is. That will save you many miserable hours trying to figure it out yourself. In the next video then, we'll move this along and we'll see how we can change our website content in a much more advanced way than just updating some text. See you there. All right, we're now going to take our JavaScript to the next level by seeing how we can not only just change the content of an element, but we can also append content to it, which means take whatever's there and then add some extra text to it. And we can make a whole element appear out of nothing. So let's get cracking. Let's add a second paragraph and I'm going to put in the words JavaScript is and then dot dot dot. And we'll give this an ID of second paragraph. And here's a little challenge. Can you add some code and a second button so that when that second button is clicked the content of this paragraph changes to hello Rob. So exactly like the first button behaves. So add a new button so that when you press that button, the content of this paragraph changes to hello Rob. Go for it. I hope you managed it. It's just a bit of co copy and paste really is all we need. So let's copy the button code. I'm going to change change text to append text. So append means adding something to the end of it. And we'll call this second button. Okay, let's just have a look. Okay, yep, that all looks fine. Obviously, append text at the moment doesn't do anything. So we need to set up some JavaScript to connect that to some code. So again, I'm going to copy and paste. And all we need to do is change the necessary bits so that it does what we want. So we want it so that when the second button is clicked, it updates the content of second paragraph to hello Rob. So second button, of course, has the ID of second button. So we want to make this function happen when second button is clicked. And we do that using document.getElementById second button dot on click equals and then function. So very quick question. What would happen if I ran this code now and then click the second button? What will happen? Hope you got it right. It should update hello world to hello Rob. There we go. It does. Because it's just doing the same thing as what the first button did. Updating the element with ID text, which is this one, to Hello, Rob. So we wanted to make it so that it updated JavaScript is. And the ID for that paragraph is second paragraph. And that's it. So now it's going to update second paragraph to Hello, Rob with any luck. 
Fantastic. Okay, so that was the mini challenge and how I expected you to do it. Let's see how then we achieve what we originally wanted, which was how to append some content to this. So first off, the content that I want to append is going to be awesome. So we end up with JavaScript is awesome. The way I'm going to do it, and it's going to take quite a long line of text, so I'm just going to extend this out so we can do it all in one line, is by copying and pasting all of this and then popping it in there and adding a plus symbol. And before I explain how that works, just take a moment to have a look at that and see if you can work out why that will append awesome to the content of second paragraph. I hope you got it. What we're essentially doing here is we're taking the inner HTML of second paragraph, which is JavaScript is dot dot dot, and then we're setting that equal to the inner HTML of second paragraph, which is JavaScript is, and then we're adding that to awesome or we're adding awesome to that. So we're setting the inner HTML of the second paragraph to whatever it is, plus the word awesome. So we're essentially adding the word awesome to the end, or in programming terms, we're appending the word awesome to whatever the content was before. So let's take a look, see if that does what we want. And there we go, JavaScript is awesome. So another teeny challenge then, could you append something else to this line and make it so that it becomes, I think JavaScript is awesome. Go for it. All right, hope you manage that. All we need to do is before we get the contents of second paragraph, we're gonna add, I think in double quotes with a space at the end, otherwise it's gonna be all one word, and then a plus again. And this means I think, and then whatever the content is, and then the word awesome. So let's have a look. JavaScript is, and I think JavaScript is awesome. I agree. All right, so finally then, how could we make some content appear out of thin air, out of nowhere. And I'm actually gonna set this as a challenge, see if you can figure it out. So how can we have no content here, just a button, and then when you click that button, you get some text, whatever you want that to be. Go for it. Did you manage it? Okay. It was a pretty tough challenge, but well done if you got there. The way I'm gonna do it is have a paragraph with an ID of empty paragraph. And then that is of course just an empty paragraph. It's just blank. Nothing will display on the screen. And then I'm gonna have a button with an ID of create paragraph. and then I'll have the words create text on it. And rather than copying and pasting this time, I'll create the code from scratch, just to give us an opportunity to see it and talk it through once again. So we want something to happen when the button with ID create paragraph is clicked. So that means we need to get that button first off. And we do that using document to say that we want something within this document. And then we say we want to get the element by its ID. Then in brackets and quotes, we give the ID. So that's create paragraph. And then we set on click to be a function. And then we have curly brackets in which we're going to put the code for our function. So that means whatever I write in here will happen when that button is clicked. And then all we need to do is make it so that we select the paragraph with ID empty paragraph and put some content in it. 
So it's exactly the same as what we had up here. When we change the content, just in this case, we're changing it from blank to some text. So let's see that in action. So document.getElementById and the ID this time is empty paragraph and then we want to set the inner HTML to let's say hi there and that's it. Let's take a look. So refresh that. So create text. Hmm, nothing's happening. Let's have a look. Find out what's going wrong. There must be an error in my code somewhere. Maybe you can see what it is. But let's have a look at the console. Document.getElementID.innerHTML is not a function. Aha, of course. So line 42, this line here, what I've done, of course, as you probably noticed, was I tried to pass the string hi there to innerHTML. And as it says, innerHTML is not a function. It's a value. It's the content of empty paragraph. So what I should have done is set it to equal to and then hi there. All right. No worries. Good use of the console. Let's have another look. Create text now. And there it is. Brilliant. So we've created something from nothing there, which is particularly useful if you've got an error message or something you want to display to the user once they've done something. A very quick thing to say is that this can be any HTML. We've only used text so far, but you can put HTML right in here as well. So let's have a look now. We've created a heading. So you can put lists, you can put forms in there, you can put whole chunks of text if you want to. Any HTML will do. All right, I hope you enjoyed those challenges. We're going to have an even bigger challenge in the next video where we're going to create the first part of our reaction game that we'll make at the end of this section. And this first part is called Disappearing Circles. All right, we just need to look at a couple of things before we can do our Disappearing Circles challenge. And that is how we can manipulate styles with JavaScript. So far, we've been manipulating content, mostly by changing this in HTML variable. But we can do the same with styles. So let's add a paragraph. I'll call it more text. And we'll have the very boring, this is some text. So that's not going to be styled at all. But let's create a button with an ID of style text. and we'll have the text, style text on it. There we go. Obviously, it doesn't do anything yet. But now, let's add some code for that button. So in just the same way, document.get element by ID. And the element that we want to get is the style text button. And then we want to add an onClick function to that. So this is going to be a function with curly brackets. And then what we want to do is just add some style to the more text paragraph. So for example, we want to go through the process, get element by ID. And the element we want to get this time is more text. And then instead of in HTML, we do style. And then, for example, if we want to change the color to red, we would have dot style dot color equals, and then in quotes, simple as that. Now let's have a look. Style text, it goes red. Fantastic. Changing the font size is very similar, but slightly trickier because it's not exactly the same. We don't use font size because we don't like that hyphen in the JavaScript. We just use font size instead. So that's using the capitalization similar to get element by ID, small f, but then capital S. And let's say we want to make it a font size of 50 pixels. 
Let's have a look. There we go. It's massive. And so feel free to play around with that. You can obviously combine several styles if you want by just having multiple commands like this. But the particular other one I want to show you, which we're going to be using in our disappearing circles, challenge is to make it disappear. And we can do that by setting the display property to none. So as you can imagine, that just sets the CSS display property to none, which effectively makes it disappear. Let's check it out. There we go. It's gone. So it's not even just disappeared, but it's actually been removed from the flow of the page. And so the button moves up as a result. So feel free to get creative and play around to see what styles you can affect with JavaScript. But we're going to go on now to our mini challenge, Disappearing Circles. All right, so here we're going to have a quick challenge, which will give you an opportunity to use the JavaScript you've learned so far, as well as force you to recall some of the CSS that we learned in the previous section. So get yourself back to just a blank HTML document with your script tags at the bottom. And then the challenge is, can you create a red, blue and yellow circle all next to each other and then set up JavaScript so that when any of those circles are clicked, it disappears. So that's a slight step forward from what we've seen so far. We haven't seen how to make anything disappear, but hopefully you can work it out. At the very least, get those circles up and see what you can make them do. Good luck. All right, I hope you managed it. There are, of course, several different ways to solve this problem, but I'm gonna go for a similar way as to how we made some circles last time. So I'm going to have a div with a class of circle and an ID of red circle. And then I'm going to add the styles for that first off. So just in the usual way. There we go. So all of the circles are going to have certain styles in common. So that's why I'm doing that as a class. So we'll start off by setting the width to be, let's say 200 pixels. We'll set the height to be 200 pixels as well. Then to make them circular, we'll set the border radius to 50%. I want them all in a row. So I'm gonna make them float left. And finally, I want a bit of a gap between them, so I'm going to give them a margin of 50 pixels. Okay, and then the only thing different between them is going to be their color. So let's put in red circle first, and that of course is going to have a background color of red. So let's just check, make sure we've got a nice big red circle there, wonderful. And then we'll just do the same. And I'm just going to copy and paste for a blue circle. And a yellow circle. And I'm just going to copy and paste the styles for those. So for the blue circle, background color of blue. And yellow circle, background color of yellow. Wonderful. I think they are floating left, but they're going off the edge of the page. So let's change the width to 100 and see if we can get them all in a row. Okay, then let's change the margin right to being 50 pixels. There we go. You could even then make them a little bit bigger. Try 
by 130. Lovely. So now we've got our circles. We've just got to create our little bit of interactivity. Now then, it's just a matter of writing a little bit of JavaScript. And that should all be fine. Let's start with the red circle. So we're going to want to add an onClick function to our element with an ID of red circle. And we want to make it so that when it's clicked, it disappears. So it should be fairly straightforward. Let's start with document to say that we want to access something in this document. And then good old get element by ID. Then we give it the ID of red circle. And then on click. And we're going to set that equal to a function, which we'll define in the curly brackets. And all we want to do is find it again. So document.getElementById red dash circle. And then set the style dot display. And just as we did in the previous video, set that to none. And that should make it disappear. Let's have a look. Click. There it goes. All right, simple enough. Now let's do it for the other two. So this is going to be very, very similar. All we need to do is change yellow circle and yellow circle. and blue circle. Blue circle. And that will just apply the same code, but to each circle. Let's have a look. Blue goes, yellow goes, red goes. All right, I hope you managed that challenge and we're gonna be coming back to this code when we create our reaction testing game at the end of this section. For now though, we're going to move on and away from HTML elements and look at some pure JavaScript, which will allow us to do much more powerful things in our web pages than what we've seen so far. And we're gonna start that process by looking at variables. So far, we've been exclusively using JavaScript to interact with the page that the user is on. But there is a huge amount more that we can do with JavaScript. And we're gonna start getting into that now by looking at a basic programming concept of variables. So first off, I'm gonna clear all this content to get us back to a nice, clean, empty page. And let's have a quick look at what I mean by a variable. So if you think back to your school days, you might remember solving equations with X or Y in them. In that case, both X and Y were variables. They were letters that represented certain values. And that's what they are in JavaScript as well, and indeed in programming in general. So we might, for example, create a variable, which we do using the keyword var, and our variable might be called X, and we might set it equal to five, for whatever reason. Simple as that. So now we've got our variable, which is called x, and it's equal to 5. We can prove that to ourselves by alerting the value of x. So notice I don't have quotes around my x this time. If I do that, it will just alert the letter x. But without quotes, it will alert the value of the variable x, which is 5. I can change the value of x, whatever I like, and that will change. I can also update the value of x later on. It's not fixed. So if it starts off as 10, I can then later on just change x to be 20, for example. I don't have the var this time because I'm not defining x. I'm just changing its value. So if x is now 20. There we go. That's the value. I can also have non-numerical variables. So I might have the variable name and set it equal to Rob. 
Now to tell the browser that this is a string, we put it in quotes, just like we have done with strings of letters all along. So let's have a look now and see what that gives us. Have a quick think. What should pop up? Of course, Rob. So variables are hugely powerful things and we're gonna use them throughout the rest of this course. But how might we use one to do something in a web page like the ones that we've been creating so far? Well, let's try this as an example and I'll set it up as a mini challenge. Can you create a text input and then a button next to it which says change the text? That's it, a text input and a button next to it that says change the text. Go for it. All right, hope you got it. Pretty straightforward. We just use input and then the default type is text, but I do like to specify anyway that we have a text input here. So there's our text input and then next to it, we're gonna have a button with the value of change the text. And there we go. All right, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna have a paragraph which just says this is some text. And then what we're going to set our little page up to do here is to allow the user to type whatever they want into the box. And then when we click that button, then whatever the user has typed in the box will replace this is some text down here. And we'll use a variable to do that. All right, so a little mini challenge for you. Can you make it so that when you click the change the text button, something happens. I don't care what it is. You can update some content. You can alert something. You can do whatever you like, but just make it so that when I click that button, something happens. Go for it. I wonder how creative you got there. I would start off by giving the button an ID. I'll call it text changer like that. And then we need to get that button. And we do that in the now hopefully familiar way of document.getElementById. And then the ID is text changer. And then we want to set the on click to a function, which we'll define with some curly brackets. So I, my challenge just said, do something. So we'll just say alert. Hi, Rob, for now, just to make sure that everything's connected up nicely. And I would recommend doing that when you're working through making a site and making interactive things, just do it really step by step. Don't try and code everything in one go because inevitably it won't work and then it'll take you ages to figure out what's wrong. But if you do it step by step, hopefully you'll make fewer mistakes. And if you do make mistakes, it'll be a lot easier to see where those mistakes are. Right, so now what I'm gonna do is get the value of our text input. And the value is going to be whatever the user has typed into it. So I'm gonna set up a variable. I'll call it text entered like that. And I'm using the same capitalization convention. So small letters all the way through, except for the beginning letters of the second and future words. And initially, I'm gonna set it to an empty string like that. So this tells the browser that we want this to be a string, but initially it's empty, just like the box is initially empty. But then I'm gonna take text entered and set it to the value of whatever the user has typed in the box. And to do that, I need to set an ID for my input, I'll just use text input. And now I want to get the value of text input. So I do that using document, dot get element by ID, text input is the ID, and then I want to get the value of that. Simple as that. So this will give us the value that the user has typed into that box. And just to check, let's alert its value. Just to take a look. So I'm just gonna put ASDF in there. 
and there we go. So we've taken our variable, we've created it, and then we've set it equal to the value of the input, which is just whatever the user has typed. So final challenge then, can you change the last line of our code so that instead of alerting text entered, it sets the value of this paragraph or the inner HTML, I should say, of this paragraph to whatever the user has typed in. Go for it. All right, hope you managed it. I'm gonna give our paragraph an ID and I'll just call it text. And then once again, we're gonna get that in the usual way, document dot get element by ID text and we're going to set its inner HTML to be equal to text entered there we go simple as that so let's run this again type in some text change the text and there we go so this is a very basic usage of variables to allow us to add a th another level of interactivity in our page. So we're not just clicking buttons and doing something, but we're actually allowing the user to type in something and then getting the results and doing something with them on our page. So variables open up a whole new world of power and interactivity that we can create with our websites. And we're gonna take that further and further over the next few videos, specifically in the next one, looking at arrays. So with variables, we saw how we could create something which contained a value, and then we could change that value later on and use it in our code to achieve something. Arrays take variables one step further and allow us to store a number of different values in one object. Now that sounds a bit weird until you've seen it in action. So let's just tidy things up a little and create an array. There's a few different ways of creating arrays in JavaScript. I'm going to show you the most common ones here. We actually use the keyword var as before to create them. So arrays are just variables, but different types of variables. And we'll call it my array. And then to tell JavaScript that we want to create an array, we use the command new and then array. And we use parentheses because this is a function which creates an array for us. So now we've got an empty array and we want to fill it with some values. So let's say we want to store some food items in this particular array for some reason. What we would do is we would take my array and specify which entry in the array we wanted to edit. And we normally start with zero. So arrays start at zero. So my array and then square back it's zero. And then we might set that equal to pizza. So just in the same way that we set the value of a variable, we can set the value of one item within an array. So my array zero is now pizza. Can you set my array one to chocolate? Go for it. Let's have a look. You should have done something like my array square brackets one is equal to chocolate. There we go. So how do we get those values if we want them? Well, just in the same way that we worked with variables in the previous video. So if we want to get pizza, we could alert my array zero, just like that. Let's refresh and then we've got pizza there. Note, if we want to view a whole array, that's not that easy to do within the page itself, but it's very easy to do within the console. So that's how I'd recommend, if you want to check what the values of an array are while you're coding, then you can use the console log. And this is a very useful thing in general. It essentially allows you to leave comments for yourself as you're developing your app, which can help you with debugging or just generally seeing what's going on. And if we want to log the values within an array, we just console.log and then my array 
in parentheses. And let's then have a look. Obviously that doesn't display anything on the page itself, but if we right click, control click and inspect, and then click on the console, it should show us, there we go. So it's array, it's got two values in it. And those two values are pizza and chocolate. Notice also we've got the length of the array, which is two. And that's a very useful number to know how many items there are in your array. And we can get them just by using myarray.length. So that will tell us how many items there are in the array. If we have a look at that, you can see we just get returned two because we've got two items in our array here. All right, so that's all well and good, you might think, but why on earth would I need one of these? Why can't I just store these in individual variables? Well, imagine you're making something like a Twitter clone and you wanted to display a user's tweets. As you're writing the program, you don't know in advance how many tweets there are gonna be because the number is gonna change. Also, you definitely don't want to define a new variable for each tweet because you're gonna to have to come up with a huge number of variable names. That would be a very messy way to work with things. So instead, what you could do is create an array, which we might call tweets. And we're gonna create this in a different way, just so that you can see a different way to create an array. So instead of using new array, we can actually just assign the values of the array right at the start. So incidentally, just a pair of square brackets there will create an empty array. So it does the same thing as that line. But if we want to put some values in, we might have, what's the sort of thing people might tweet? Morning, everybody, something like that. And they might say, I love coffee, that kind of thing. What a Twitter feed this would be. So now what we've got here is two tweets within our tweets array. And hopefully this gives you a bit of a clue as to why arrays are so powerful. Because we could add as many tweets as we wanted to this array, display them all, we could delete ones, we can edit them, but we only have a single variable name to deal with. And it kind of makes sense. It's just a single variable called tweets. We don't need a different variable name for each of these because they're all tweets. So pretty much any web app you could imagine is going to need arrays to store lists of data. So you think of an email client, for example, has to store the user's contacts, the user's emails, and all sorts of other information that you don't know how many items there are gonna be. And in that situation, arrays are perfect. So it's a very quick challenge. Can you alert the I love coffee tweet? just to make sure that you've got the hang of how arrays work. Go for it. All right, hope you did it. Pretty easy. Just alert and then we want tweets one. That was the only slight trick. You might have forgotten that arrays start at zero and thought that that was number one and then attempted to alert tweets two and then got an error because tweets two doesn't exist. So this is tweets zero and I love coffee is tweets one. Let's just have a look, there we go. Brilliant. So what if we want to add a third tweet to our list? So our user has just come along and tweeted something just as exciting as these two tweets and we want to add it to their list of tweets. That's pretty easy. We can use the command push. So tweets.push will add a third item to this array at the end of the array. And then we give the value that we want to add onto the end of our tweets array. So what's the sort of thing this guy might say? Maybe something like back to work, because he's hilarious. So that will add back to work onto the end of the array. So very quickly, can you log to the console the tweets array so we can have a look and see what's inside it now. Hope you remembered that it's just console.log and then whatever we want to log. So in this case, the tweets array. So let's take a look, refresh the page and there we go. So there's our array. It's got a length of three, so three items in it. Morning everybody, I love coffee and back to work. Fantastic. What about removing items from arrays? That's pretty easy to do as well. We've got a command for it within JavaScript. And this is splice. 
which allows us to do actually a lot more than just deleting, but I'll show you how we can get rid of one of these tweets. So let's, for example, decide that our tweeter decides that his I love coffee tweet was rather inane and wanted to delete it. Then we would give the splice command two variables. Firstly, the number of the item in the array that we wanted to start deleting. So remember, morning everybody is the zeroth item. I love coffee is number one and back to work is number two, just as it says over here on the left. So if I wanted to delete I love coffee, we'd start at number one because I love coffee is number one. And then if we just wanted to delete, delete that one, then we would say I want to delete one tweet starting at item one. So that should delete just I love coffee. And there we go. Now you can see we've got left morning everybody and back to work. So what we're doing here is we're passing two variables to this splice function and they give the function a bit of information. So it says start deleting at item number one and delete one item. So can you change our splice function so that we delete both I love coffee and back to work? How would we do that? All right, hope you got it. All we need to do is change the second number to a two, and that will then instruct it to delete two items starting at item number one. So let's have a look. We should just be left with morning everybody. Perfect. We can also use the splice function to add in items. So let's say we wanted to add in a tweet before I love coffee. Then what we would do is we say, I want to add my new tweet at number one. I don't want to delete any tweets. And the content of the new tweet that I want to add in is, I don't know, cornflakes for breakfast. And of course, the requisite exclamation mark. So this should add in the item cornflakes for breakfast just before item number one. Let's have a look. There we go. So now we've got morning everybody, cornflakes for breakfast, I love coffee and back to work. Quick, very quick challenge for you. How could you change splice now to, instead of just adding in cornflakes for breakfast, replace I love coffee with cornflakes for breakfast? Go for it. Did you manage it? It's actually pretty straightforward. We just change the zero to a one. And this will mean we want to add in a new item before tweet number one, but we also want to delete tweet number one and then add in cornflakes for breakfast. So we should now have just three tweets without I love coffee. There you go. And you can add in as many items as you like here as well. As many inane tweets as you can imagine, just by separating them with commas. So if our tweeter felt that cornflakes for breakfast wasn't enough information, he might add a num num tweet immediately after. Let's have a look. There we go. So we've now got morning everybody, cornflakes for breakfast, num num, and back to work. All right, there's a huge amount more that you can do with arrays, but that's as far as we're gonna go for now, because I don't want you to have to memorize lots of different array functions, but as we need them, we'll come back to them and see what else we can do with arrays. You'll notice that what we've got here is pure code. We don't actually have any content in our page at all. And increasingly in the JavaScript section and the next section, we're gonna be looking at more complex code to do more advanced things. And this is really what programming or coding is all about. It's not so much about the layout of your page as the logic behind it. And that's where things get really powerful and I think really exciting. And talking of logic, we're gonna learn our first logic command in the next video, and that is the if statement. See you there. So in the two previous videos, we saw the two basic ways to store information in JavaScript using variables and arrays. In the next few videos, we're going to see how we can use JavaScript to affect the logic of the application, i.e. what it does. The code that we've written so far is gonna do the same thing every time. But what if we want our code to do different things depending on different situations? Well, for that, we'd use an if statement. So let's get rid of the code we've got so far. And can you set up a variable for me called x with a value of one? Go for it. 
Hope you manage that. Var to create a variable x to name the variable and then equals one to give it that value. So what we're going to do with this is create an if statement which depends on the value of x. And this looks like this. So we start with if and then in parentheses we put our condition that we want to be true. And I'm going to test for whether or not x is equal to 1. That might seem a bit crazy when I know that x is equal to 1, but just stay with me for the moment. Now we test whether x is equal to 1 using x and then double equals 1. Now that can be quite confusing for new programmers, but it actually makes a lot of sense. When you see a single equals in a program, it means that you're setting the value of something to something else. When you see a double equals, it means we're testing whether or not those two things are the same. So it's a logical difference and therefore there's a different symbol. So it's two equal signs. But it is a very common beginner mistake to just put one equal sign there and then what you'll find is this will set x is equal to 1 and say that the statement is true which is very rarely what you want to happen. So always put two equal signs in in an if statement. And then just like with functions that we saw a few videos ago we have curly brackets to contain whatever code we want to happen if x is 1. So we might for example just alert x is 1. Hurrah! So let's just check. See what happens. x is indeed 1. What would happen then in this program if I changed x to be 2? What would happen when I run it? I hope you got the answer which is absolutely nothing because x is not 1 anymore so it's not going to alert that. We can actually have an else statement at the end of our if statement which will do something if this is not true. So if x is 1 then we're going to alert that. If it's not we'll alert x is not 1. Simple as that. So now when we run it we get x is not 1. And of course if we change it back to 1 we'll get x is equal to 1. So this is obviously a very simplistic example and may seem a little bit inane. So let's try and link it with something that we might have in a real web page. So something that almost every web app needs to do at some point is to log you in. And obviously if statements are absolutely crucial to that. So you're going to expect the user to enter username and password and then you're going to use an if statement to see if the username is correct and the password is correct then log the user in. If not give them some sort of error message. So we're going to create a very minimal login system and I'm actually going to set you this as a challenge. So rather than have a username and a password we're going to have a magic word. Now you can set that magic word to be whatever you like but what I want is for our page to say what is the magic word and then have a text input for the user to enter it and a button when they're done and then an alert to tell them whether or not they've got it right. Simple as that. Go for it. All right, hope you managed it. So let's have a paragraph tag saying what is the magic word. And then on the next line we'll have an input with a type of text. And an ID of magic word. And then on the final line, we'll have our button with an ID of check magic word, because that's what we're going to do when the button is pressed. And we'll have enter on our button. There we go. That looks good. So now we've written the content of our page, let's write the logic. So we only want our logic to happen when the button is pressed. So we know how to do that now, hopefully. Document.getElementById. 
The ID of the button is check magic word and we want to set on click to be equal to a function that we're going to make and then we put that function in curly brackets. So first off as always I'm just going to alert something just to make sure that everything's connected up right. There we go. So I definitely recommend always writing your JavaScript step by step like this not doing it all in one go. So now what we're going to need to do is get the value of whatever the user has typed so we can check it against our magic word. So let's create a variable for that and I'm going to call it magic word entered and I'm going to set that equal to the value of this text input. So remember the text input has an ID of magic word so we'll use document dot get element by ID magic word and we want to get the value of that so as we did in the previous video dot value to get the value of that and once again because I like things happening really step by step I'm just going to alert the value of that to make sure that everything once again is wired up correctly so let's just put in ASDF ASDF brilliant step by step you're much less likely to go wrong, much easier to fix it if you do go wrong. Alright, the second variable I'm going to create is the actual magic word. Because I want to keep this not kind of embedded deeply in my code, I might want to change it at some point. So I'm going to have abracadabra as my magic word for obvious reasons. And now what we want to do is set up our if statement and it's pretty straightforward hopefully so if and then parentheses so if magic word entered is equal to and remember we need the double equals because we're checking whether or not it's equal to rather than setting it equal to so if that's equal to magic word we'll just alert something like you got it and then obviously if this was a real kind of web page we'd add some logic for either logging the user in or doing whatever it is that this page is supposed to do when the user get this gets the magic word correct and if it's not we'll alert nope try again there we go so that should do it let's find out so let's get it right first off. Abracadabra. Enter. You got it. Fantastic. And then if we enter anything else. Nope. Try again. Brilliant. So I hope you managed to do that more or less by yourself. But hopefully this gives you a clear idea of why if statements are so important. Essentially they allow us to do something on a certain condition happening. And that's absolutely central to the idea of programming. And in fact, now that we know about if statements, we're capable of building some basic JavaScript games. And we're going to do that in the next video where we'll make a simple game called How Many Fingers. All right, so in this video, we're going to have a little bit of fun with if statements and create this very simple game where we simulate the, the age old game of how many fingers am I holding up? So it's going to look like this. We'll ask the user, how many fingers am I holding up? And they simply have to guess a number between zero and five. So if I guess four, for example, oh, I get it wrong. The number was two. If I guess two on the next one, nope, the number was one. You get the idea. I'll just do one more guess. Nope, wrong again. Oh, well. So this is what we're creating. And as you may notice, there's one fairly crucial new bit of code that we need that we haven't covered yet and that is random numbers. We haven't seen how we can generate a random number with JavaScript but I'm going to set that as a bit of a challenge so if you're feeling confident then just have a Google and see if you can work out how you create a random number which is 0, 1, 2, 3, 4 or 5. The information is already there and as I've said before the art of coding is really about 80% looking stuff up on Google so you might as well get used to it early on in the process. 
Don't worry though, if you can't find the information or can't quite make it work, I'll explain that at the beginning of the process as I go through making up the game. So best of luck, hope it goes well. All right, did you manage it? I'm gonna start by just taking us down to our basic code structure so we can start from scratch. So let's start by looking at that random number generator that I mentioned. What we want is a random number between zero and five to represent the number of fingers that the computer's imaginary hand might be holding up. So let's do a little Google. JavaScript random number zero to five, something like that, because it's such a general query, we might even be able to have something as specific as between zero and five. So here we go, generating random numbers in JavaScript in a specific range. That sounds perfect. Good old stack overflow. So how can I generate a random whole number between two specified values in JavaScript? Perfect. Let's have a look. Now that looks like a great answer, but it's using functions and returning and we haven't seen anything like that yet. So I'm going to ignore that one and see if we can find a simpler example. Mm, no, not really. Still got functions here. Okay, now this is looking good. So this code should return a random number between 1 and 10. So let's see if we can break it up and see what's going on. I think the key command here is this math.random. Definitely seems to be generating a random number. So why not take that bit of the code math.random with the parentheses because it's a function so it's going to need those and just see what happens when we run it. It looks like it's going to generate some sort of random number. So for now let's just alert it and see what we get. Right, okay, let's run it again. Okay, I think I get the idea. I think what this is doing is generating a random number between 0 and 1. And I could verify that if I wanted by just googling the math random function and seeing what information I could get about it. So if this is generating a random number between 0 and 1 and I want a random number between 0 and 5, I probably just want to take this and multiply it by 5. And we do that in JavaScript using the asterisk or shift 8 on my keyboard and then the number that we want to multiply by. So this will create a random number between 0 and 1 and multiply it by 5. So that will give us a bigger random number between 0 and 5. We're getting the idea this is looking good. The only problem we have so far is that this is a very precise random number and it's unlikely the user is going to be able to get it. So what we want to do is get a whole number out of that. And going back to our stack overflow answer here, this math.floor function looks like it does exactly that. If I wanted I could look up that function but what I'd rather do is just try it out and see what happens. So math.floor and let's apply that to all of this. And now run it. Oh, I've got an error of some sort. Oh, yep, yeah, that's because I need a second bracket at the end there. Okay, so now I've got two, three, four. One. This is looking good. Four. Okay. So what it's looking like is that this floor function essentially gets rid of the decimal point. So if you've got 3.521, then that will give you three. And again, I could check that with a quick Google if I wanted to. So this is looking very good. The only issue is what we're never going to get out of this is the number five. because the biggest that we're going to get from our 
math random times 5 is 5. And even that is extremely unlikely that we get exactly 5. So if we want to get a random number between 0 and 5, we need to change this to times by 6. And then the random number will go between 0 and 6. And then the math floor will take it down to between 0, 1, 2, 3, 4 and 5. So that's as far as I think you need to go on the explanation of how we generate our random number. Now I'm going to give you the opportunity to create the game using code that you are familiar with. Good luck. All right, here we go then. Let's go from the start and let's start with the HTML so that we know what our page is going to look like. So I'm going to start with a paragraph asking the user how many fingers am I holding up? So you might want to add a bit more information there just to clarify that essentially you're guessing a random number between 0 and 5. But I'll just leave it at that. Then we're going to have on the next line an input with a type of text and an ID of guess this is going to be where the user guesses and then straight after that I'll put my button with an ID of check guess because that's what we're going to do when the button is clicked and then guess all right let's have a look okay yep that looks good to me so the user is going to tap in there guess for and then click that button to see if they're right Okay, so now we've done the content, it's time for some logic. So again, we want this logic to happen when the button is pressed. So we're going to start by setting our on click for our button. So we've got document .get element by ID as we're very used to. The ID is check guess to get the button. And then we want to set on click to a function that we'll create in curly brackets. And as usual, I'll just check that everything's set up OK. Yeah, brilliant. All right, so let's start by generating our random number. I'm going to create a variable to contain it, and I'll call it random number and I could create it all in one go but then we get that sort of slightly confusing code that looks like this and I don't really want something like that I want something a little bit clearer so I'm gonna create it step by step starting off by just doing math dot random so so far our random number is anything between 0 and 1 so first off I want to make it between 0 and 6 so what I do is I take random number and I set it equal to whatever it was before multiplied by 6 as we saw a few moments ago. So now we've got a random number between 0 and 6. We want to make that into a whole number between 0 and 5 and we use the math floor function for that. So now we take random number again and we set it equal to math.floor random number. So if it's 5.3 it will become 5, if it's 0 0.89 it'll become 0, etc. So now we've got our random number in a format that we want it. So now it's just a matter of checking to see whether the guess is the same as our answer. So let's find out if the guess, so that is document dot get element by ID and the ID is guess and then we want to get the value of the input so if that is equal to random number then we'll alert well done you got it something like that
And if it's not, then we'll alert Nope. And we'll tell the user what it was so that they feel like we're not just lying to them. The number was, and then hopefully you'll remember from a few videos ago when we concatenated our strings or put them together. And we're going to put random number on the end of that. So that will say, nope, the number was, and then it will display whatever the random number was. All right, let's take a look. So it should work in its current form. So I'm going to guess three. Surprisingly enough, I got it wrong. The number was five. I'm going to keep guessing three until I get it right. Nope, the number was two. Nope, the number was one. Oh, we could be here for a while. So yeah, this is not the best game that anyone's ever made. Hey, I got there in the end. Brilliant. So I hope you managed to make that more or less by yourself. There's obviously quite a few ways you could take this to make it a bit more interesting. So just to give you a few ideas, if you want to experiment, at the moment we're generating a random number each time, so the user only has one guess. But what you could do is generate the random number at the beginning when the page is loaded, and then allow the user to have several guesses just for that random number. And then it'd be a challenge of how many guesses it would take to get there. You could even use the greater or less than signs. So that is signs that look like that greater than and that less than to tell the user whether they're too high or too low. That would be a great challenge and make the game quite a bit more interesting as well. But I will leave those challenges to you and we will move on in the next video to the second most important way of affecting the logic or flow of our program and that is loops. So along with if statements, a second fundamental way of altering the flow or the logic of your code is a loop. And we're going to look at two different types of loop. And the first one is the for loop. So loops are a little bit tricky to explain until you see them in action. And then they really are quite straightforward. Essentially, they allow you to run certain lines of code again and again, doing usually something slightly different each time. So let's see how we set up a for loop. We use the command for to start off our loop, and then we need to add some information for our for loop. And first off, we create a counter variable, which counts each time we go through the loop. So we usually create that with var, and the standard letter that we use for counting is i. That's been used since the very early days of computing. It's likely because i is short for index. So it's the index which counts how many times we've gone through the loop. And then we set that value to something initially. And usually we start with zero. So we've created our counter variable i and we've set it equal to zero so far. Then we use a semicolon. Interestingly, not to end the command, but just to end that little bit of it and give the next instruction, which is how many times we're going to do the loop. So if we want to do the loop five times, for example, we would keep on going as long as i is less than five. So the first time i is going to be zero, then the next time it's going to be one, next time it's going to be two, next time it's going to be three, then four. So that will be our five times. So that's the instruction to keep going as long as i is less than five. The final instruction, the third and final instruction, is what to do to i each time. And the usual thing is to add 1 to i, so it becomes 0, 1, 2, 3 each time you've gone through the loop. There are two ways to do that. The most kind of obvious way is to do that. So each time you go through the loop, take i and set it to the old value of i plus 1. So that essentially increments i each time. That's a bit wordy though, and we use it a lot in loops. So there's a shortcut way of doing it, which is i++, which is quite a neat way of saying just add one to i. And that works in pretty much every programming language. So it's a pretty cool thing to learn. All right, so now we've set up our loop. It starts off with our counter variable equal to zero. It 
adds, it adds one to our counter variable each time and it keeps going as long as our counter variable is less than five. So then we need to give the instructions of what we want to happen each time the loop takes place. And just like with functions, we do this in curly brackets. So the same as if statements as well. And for now, all we'll do is alert the value of i. So this should give us 0, and then 1, and then 2, and then 3, and then 4, and then stop. With any luck. Let's take a look. So yep, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, stop. Brilliant. So that's the long and the short of it, really. Let's just play around with it a little bit to get you thinking. If we change that to a 3 and that to a 7, can you tell me what this is going to alert? Go for it. Did you get it right? Let's see. So it starts at 3, then 4, then 5, then 6, then stop, because it keeps going as long as it's less than 7. All right, here's a challenge for you. Can you change it so that it, instead of going up by one each time, it goes down by one each time, and we get 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Go for it. Hope you manage that. So we're going to start with i is equal to 5. We want to keep going as long as i is greater than 0, because we want 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, and then stop. And instead of i++, plus plus, hopefully you guess this, to decrease by 1 each time, we use i minus minus. So this should give us 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Brilliant. All right, feel free to play around with that much more and see if you can find different ways of doing things. But I'm actually going to combine for loops and arrays because they are really a match made in heaven. Going back to our example when we introduced arrays of tweets, if we want to display all the tweets and we don't know how many there are, what we're going to need to do is loop through the array. So we start with the first tweet, display that. Move on to the second tweet, display that, etc., etc. And that's actually really easy to do with loops. So let's set up our array of tweets. I can't remember what my inane tweets were last time. Something like this. I love cornflakes and we'll have one more. Let's say it's night night and a smiley face. Lovely. I quite like this guy. All right. So I'm going to set this as a challenge then. Can you display or alert each of the values in this tweets array using the loop? Go for it. Okay, hope you managed it. All we need to do is set i back to 0 at the beginning. And we want to keep going. So remember, this is the 0th tweet. This is tweet number 1. And this is tweet number 2. So we want to keep going as long as i is less than 3. Because we want i to be 0, 1, 2, and then stop. And of course, we want i to go up by 1 each time. So I'll change that back to i++. Plus plus. And then we're going to alert tweets. But which item do we want? We want the ith item. So this will be tweets 0 the first time round, tweets 1 the second time round, and tweets 2 the third time round. So let's have a look and see if that works. Hi everyone comes up first. Excellent. I love cornflakes and then night night. Brilliant. I hope you managed something like that. Now, extra bonus points for you if you realized that in our Twitter program, as we've mentioned, we don't necessarily know how many tweets there are going to be. So what we can do is change this three here to, as we saw in the arrays video, we can use tweets.length to give us the number of tweets in the array. 
So tweets.length at the moment is one, two, three. But the great advantage of the code as it is now is that I could add a fourth tweet. Let's say sweet dreams. Oh, and I forgot my semicolon there as well. And then without updating this code at all, it now display with any luck all four tweets. So one, two, three, four. There we go. So that's how we loop through an array with a for loop. And that is a really useful thing to be able to do with pretty much any web app or website that we're working on. A little final challenge for you then. Can you change this code so that instead of alerting all of the tweets, it displays each of them on a separate line? Go for it. All right, I hope you manage that. Not that easy, but not too tricky either. Let's create a div for our tweets, which I'll give an ID of tweet div. And then what I'm going to do is create a variable called tweet string which is going to hold the HTML for my tweets and then at the very end I'll update the tweet div ID to have the content of tweet string. So each time we go through the loop I'm going to take tweet string and I'm going to set it equal to whatever it was before. So tweet string so we're taking tweet string and we're setting it equal to whatever it was before plus and we're going to need a paragraph tag and then the tweet item itself so tweets i and then we'll close the paragraph tag so this will add a paragraph containing the new tweet to tweet string. And finally, when we're done, I'm going to take my tweet div and add the HTML to it. So document dot get element by ID. The ID is tweet div. And we want to set the inner HTML of that to be equal to tweet string. All right, let's take a look. Oh, okay. Now this is good. I've got everything that I wanted and it's on separate lines, but I've got this interesting undefined up here. So have a quick moment to think about why we might have this undefined at the top there. Did you get it? It's because even though we've created the variable tweet string, we haven't set it equal to anything. So at the moment, when we define it, it's equal to undefined because it's not been set equal to anything. So the first time we do this, we're taking tweet string and we're setting it equal to tweet string, which doesn't have any value. So that's why we've got this weird undefined at the very beginning there. And then we're adding other stuff to it. So the lesson from that is you should always give your variables a value, even if it's just an empty string. So this tells JavaScript that we're going to start off with an empty string and then we're going to add some information to it later on. So if we now run that again, we should find that the undefined disappears. Great. I hope you managed to, to do most of that by yourself and I hope you're beginning to see the power that we can get by combining for loops and arrays for displaying large amounts of data in our websites. Good stuff. Now, as I mentioned, there are two types of loops and we've looked at four loops here, but actually my favorite type of loop is a while loop and we'll see how that differs and why we might use each different type in the next video. All right, so now we've seen how for loops can be used to cycle through arrays. We'll see how we can do exactly the same thing with a while loop. And then we'll see a different example that shows the situation that you might prefer using a while loop rather than a for loop. 
So I'm going to take what we've got here and just turn it into a while loop first off from a for loop. And that should hopefully make it pretty clear how while loops work. So remember with a for loop, we start off with stating that i is initially zero, and then we keep going as long as i is less than the number of tweets or the number of items in this array, and we increase i by one every time. So to do that with a while loop, we would set i to be zero outside the loop this time, and then we get rid of our for instructions and replace that with a while. And then all we state in the definition of our loop is the condition for the while loop to continue. So while i is less than, and again, tweets dot length. So this will now keep going as long as i is less than tweets dot length. What we don't have yet is an instruction to increase i by one every time. And that is now a complete while loop, which will do exactly the same thing as the for loop that we had before. So let's just check. Yep, there we go. We get exactly the same output. But you can see the logic is a little bit different. We're defining our counter variable first. Then we're saying keep going as long as our counter variable is less than this. And then each time the loop goes through, we're manually adding one to i. So it's the same thing, but structured slightly differently. I actually prefer while loops generally because they're a bit more flexible, but in most cases, when you're using a for loop, you could use a while loop. It's up to you. So when might a while loop be a good idea? Well, to demonstrate that, I'm gonna go back to our how many fingers app, but I'm gonna turn it around. So instead of us guessing how many fingers the computer is holding up, the computer has to guess how many fingers we're holding up. And essentially, I'm gonna set it up so we state how many fingers we're holding up, and then the computer keeps taking random guesses until it gets it right, and then it tells you how many guesses it took. So I'm gonna set this as a optional challenge. So it's quite a tricky one, but we're not gonna do any Googling. There's no new information here. It's just using while loops in a more advanced way. So I'll give you a moment to pause the video and give it a shot if you're feeling confident. All right, I hope that went well. Don't worry if it didn't, it was a tricky one, as I said. So I'm gonna start by saying, how many fingers are you, that is the user of the website, holding up? And then we'll have an input with a type of text and an ID of, let's call it my number. And then a button that says guess. And we'll give that an ID of guess. That's it, so the idea is that we'll say three and then the computer will have to guess. So, as usual, we want the action to commence when the guess button is pressed. So we'll set that up, document.getElementById. Guess, and then we want to add an on click to that, which is our usual function, and then curly brackets. And then I'm not gonna do a check immediately this time because I'm pretty confident about that, but I'll set up a variable, my number, which is going to equal whatever the user has entered. So that's gonna be document.getElementById, and the ID is my number, and we want the value of that, as we've seen before. And I'm, I'm just gonna alert my number, just because I don't wanna do too much before. We know that everything's set up okay.
Brilliant. That's looking good. So now we're going to get the computer to choose a random number between 0 and 5. So we've done this before. So we'll call this guess and that's initially going to be math.random. Then we multiply it by 6. And then we use math floor to make it a whole number between 0 and 5. All right, then we want to do a check to see if the computer got it right. So if guess is equal to my number, then the computer got it right. So for now, I'm just going to put a little comment in there saying computer is correct. Else computer is wrong. So what we want to happen is we want this to go on and on and on until we get to here. The computer is correct and then we want to tell the user how many goes it took. So what I'm going to do is set up a variable called got it. And this is going to be a new type of variable that we haven't seen before, which is called a Boolean. And a Boolean variable is either true or false. So initially, got it is false because the computer hasn't got it yet. And then when it has got it, we'll set got it to true. So this is the clever bit. We're going to keep going as long as got it is false. And we're actually going to keep doing all of this until got it is no longer false. So let's indent that so that we can see this is all part of the while loop. So remember, the computer gets it at this point if guess is equal to my number. So at this point, we will set got it is equal to true. And we also want to alert got it. And now if they're wrong, we want to just add one to the number of guesses so that we know how many guesses the computer has had. So let's set that number of guesses. So we'll start off at one because it's going to take the computer at least one guess. And then if the computer gets it wrong, we'll add one to the number of guesses. So take a moment just to see the logic of this. As long as got it is false, we're going to go round and round until got it becomes true. And then we won't do it again. So you can hopefully see one big advantage of this is that while loops can have varying lengths. Now that is true for for loops as well, but while loops are kind of set up for that more naturally. So this is simply going to keep going until the computer gets it right. So let's just justify that we've got it right by telling the user what it was. So it was a, and then we're going to, we could use either guess or my number here. They're both the same, doesn't really matter. I'll use guess. And then we need to say, it took me and then let's just expand this so we can see it clearly number of guesses guesses so hopefully hopefully that makes sense we're going to say got it it was a and then whatever the number was it took me number of guesses guesses so let's have a look I've done quite a lot there without checking, so fingers crossed it worked. 
So let's try three. And guess. Got it. It was a three. It took six guesses. Sounds about right. Excellent. So it looks like our system is working. Fantastic. All right. So that's how our while loop here works and how potentially it can go on until something happens. We don't necessarily have to state how many times it's going to happen in advance. It does give me the opportunity for a quick warning though. And when you use while loops like this, we need to be careful that our while loop is not going to potentially go on forever. Now, we're guessing continual random numbers here. But there's a very small possibility we could go on for ages and ages before the computer gets it right. But that's pretty unlikely, and I'd be willing to, to let that go. But as we've got a free input here, the user could enter a 6, for example. And if we press guess now, something very bad is going to happen. And essentially what we've done is we've crashed the browser because the computer's never going to get it because the computer only guesses 0, 1, 2, 3, 4 or 5. So it's not going to guess 6. So we'd have to have a check in place. There we go. It's even become unresponsive. Yikes. We definitely want to avoid that. But we should definitely have a check to make sure that the user has entered 0, 1, 2, 3, 4 or 5. I'm just going to restart that page. So a better option here would be a drop down. So my final challenge for you for this video is to change the input to a drop down or a select, which only allows the user to enter 0, 1, 2, 3, 4 or 5. Go for it. All right. I hope you remembered how to do it. So instead of an input, we're going to have a select. The ID will remain the same, but then we'll have our options. So we've got zero, one, two, three, four, five. Let's put those in. There we go. End the select and then have our button. And I think we slightly need to actually to put the paragraph down there. There we go. So let's take a look. This now is cleaner and there should be no way that this should crash. One final way that you could be absolutely certain would be to have a check at some point to see if the number of guesses was bigger than 100 or something like that. And if that was the case, then something's probably gone wrong. That'd be a good way to make absolutely sure this thing wasn't going to crash. All right, so that's a good use of while loops. You'll be pleased to hear that you've nearly made it to the end of the JavaScript section. And then we're going to be making our big JavaScript project, which is a reaction tester. So we've already kind of looked at functions already. So we've created a function, which is just a chunk of code that happens at a certain time. And we've made this code to happen when that button is clicked. But we can also create our own functions that do whatever we want. So I'm going to get rid of the text that's there for the moment and this. But we will come back to this because we're going to be remaking this with functions at the end of this video. But for now, let's just see how we define a very basic function. So to define a function, we use the keyword function. And then we call the function whatever we want. So I'm going to make a very basic function that just sends an alert. So I'm going to call it alert me. And then we use parentheses as part of our function definition. This one, I'm not going to send any information to it. I'm just going to call it. 
So we've just got empty parentheses as we've seen before. And all this function is going to do is alert, hi there Rob, and that's it. So at the moment, that won't do anything because all I've done is defined the function. I haven't actually done this request yet. So if I wanted to do it, all I would do is use the command alert me to run the function alert me. So that will now alert, hi there Rob. So you might ask, why, why would we bother doing this? It's a little bit of a complicated way of just doing that. Well, the main thing is what you'll probably find when you're writing bigger, more complicated websites is that there are certain things that you want to do again and again. And what is generally a really bad idea is writing code and then copying and pasting that code into different portions of your JavaScript. Much better is to collect that code together into a function and then just call that function whenever you want to do that thing. So if you are making a game, for example, you might have a function that moves the main character. And then when a key is pressed, then it calls that function and moves them in a certain direction. Or you might have a function get tweets, which gets the latest tweets for a particular user. And then the program can display them wherever you want them. So they're essentially a way of keeping your code better organized, more easily updatable and easier to read. As a general rule, if you find yourself writing the same command twice, it's probably better to put it in a function. So functions can obviously do a lot more than just alert things. And as we've seen, they can receive values as well. So let's see how we receive those values. Let's say, for example, I'm writing a website which requires me to average numbers a lot. So take two numbers and find the average of them. So if I wanted to find the average of x and y, let's say I've got an x, which is 5, and a y, which is 10. Obviously, I could do x plus y, and then put that in brackets, and divide it by 2. That would give me the average of those two. But if I was doing that again and again and again, I'd probably want to store that code somewhere else so I didn't have it in lots of different places in my app. So how could we do that with a function? Well, let's change this function to be called average. And this function is now going to need two numbers because it can't tell you the average of the numbers unless you tell the function what the numbers are. So within our function, let's call these numbers A and B. And that means that whenever we call this function average now, we're going to need to pass two numbers to it. So then our function is going to take the two numbers, add them together, and divide them by two, just like we said here. And what we're going to want is the result to be given back once the function is complete. And we do that using the keyword return. And then we put whatever value we want to return in brackets, like that. So what this will now do is allow us to call the function average with two numbers, and then it will return the value of those two numbers added together and divided by two. So let's see it in action. Let's alert the average of x and y. Let's have a look. The answer is 7.5. So this is calling the function average with the two numbers x and y, and then the code will jump over here to average, and then it will do the calculation, add them together and divide by two, and then it will return that here. So essentially it replaces this with the number that it finds when it adds them together and divides them by two. So again, a fairly trivial example, but you can imagine some code where you're averaging a lot. It's a lot simpler to have your average function outside and then just look at this and you'll say, oh, what I'm doing there is finding the average of the two of them. So that's how we use functions to receive and return values of things. Let's jump back using command Z to our 
number guessing game and see how we can redefine this in terms of functions. Now this code is not particularly complicated. We can follow it through and just about see what's going on, but it might make more sense to extract the guessing part of it as a function. So let's see how that might look. So at the beginning of my code, I'm going to define function and I'll call it do a guess. And the only information the function needs is the correct answer. So we'll call that correct answer. And that's what we'll refer to it as in the function. So the bit that we want to extract then is this bit here. So I'm just going to copy all of that and I'll make some changes while we're in. So we're going to create our guess variable and we're going to multiply it by six and use floor to make it a whole number. And what we're going to do is check to see if guess is equal to not my number this time, but correct answer, because that's what we're calling it within this function. And what we're going to do is, if we've got it right, then we'll return true, which is, remember, a Boolean. And if we've got it wrong, we'll return false. So what we're essentially doing is siloing a certain chunk of code or piece of logic into its own section of our code. It doesn't change a great deal. And in this case, it doesn't make it a lot more efficient, but hopefully you can see that it makes a bit more sense to have this separate. So now I no longer need this chunk of code because the guess is all happening inside the function up here. So instead of checking whether guess is equal to my number, I'm going to check whether do a guess is equal to true. And remember, I need to send the correct answer to do a guess. And the correct answer is my number here. So the logic is still the same, but the structure of the code is now a bit different. And the do a guess section of the code is taken out of the main body. So whether you think that's better than it was before is a matter of opinion. But definitely when your code gets more complicated, you'll find that taking chunks out into functions just makes it so much easier to manage. One more quick change before we run it is this variable guess is now only defined inside this function. And this is something called scope, which we'll look at in much greater detail as we go on in the course. But essentially, if a variable is defined inside a function, it will only be available inside that function. So we can't use the variable guess down here, but that's not a problem because we have the correct answer in another variable, my number. So let's just use my number instead. All right, let's just have a look and make sure that things work. Yep, good. Looks like it's doing the right thing. So it's the same code, just restructured in the form of a function. So far, we've declared variables using var. And this used to be the standard way to use variables in JavaScript. I'm just going to explain a couple of other ways to declare a variable. Let's take a quick look at how defining variables with var works so that you can see the difference. Bear with me for a few moments. We'll just get rid of our code from the last lecture. Refresh to an empty page. To demonstrate, we'll do a for loop, which you're already familiar with. And we'll declare a variable called i. We want i to be 0, i to be less than 5, and increment i++. 
Inside the loop, we'll declare another variable called j and assign it hello to it, just as a very basic example of us doing something inside this loop. And we'll output the result of i to the console. We'll do the same for j. So we have a block of code inside the for loop. And if we save and run this, let's take a look at the console. As expected, we get 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4, followed by hello each time the loop has gone round. Then, outside the loop, we'll output the console again. I can just copy and paste this code. Save and refresh. And if we have another look at the console, we get a further output. i is 5 because it was incremented once more before the loop stops. When you declare a variable using var, this is function scoped, which means that the variable can be accessed anywhere if it were inside a function. In other words, it can be accessed or changed globally inside the code of a function as long as it has been declared. And we can even declare it again like this, making j goodbye. And then j equals hello again. You'll notice that goodbye isn't shown on the console because j was overwritten by hello again before we got the output to the console. So that's how we've been declaring variables so far. But we can declare variables using two other keywords, and this was a big change to JavaScript a few years ago. We can declare variables using the keyword let. So I'm going to replace var with let inside this for loop. Nice and easy. For the moment, I'm just going to delete those lines of code outside the loop. Save and refresh. We get exactly the same result as the first time we ran the loop. But if I try to output i and j outside the loop, I get this error. I is not defined. My code stops running and it doesn't even try to output j. This is because a variable declared using let is block scoped and only available inside this block of code. But if I give i a value of 10 outside the for loop and j equals goodbye, that will run because now I've declared the variable and this code is within the scope of those variables. However, what I can't do is declare the variable again like I did with var. So if I tried to make j a let, and again here, I get an error, j has already been declared. So why would you want to use let over var? As your code gets more complex, it's easier to make mistakes. With a var variable, you can declare the same variable again and again and assign it a value. And there's a chance variables can get overwritten if they can be accessed anywhere. Normally, when you declare a variable, you're thinking that it's the first time it's been declared. And because var lets you declare the variable name again and again, as your code gets more complex, you could overwrite variables that you didn't mean to. Let will save us from making that simple mistake. You can also declare a variable using const. It works in a very similar manner to let in how it's block scoped and can't be declared again, but with one main difference. If I make i a const, save and refresh to run that. Whoops, I just need to get rid of the j declaration so that it will run. And in the console, you can see assignment to constant variable. We output i the one time, but when we looped around again and tried to increment i, we couldn't because the const is sort for constant. So the value can't be changed. We place values we don't want to be changed into a const variable. So whenever possible, you should really use let and const for your variable declarations, which will reduce the chance of overwriting variables when you don't mean to. 
feel free to experiment with different ways of declaring variables. In the next lecture, we're going to do a reaction test again. I'll see you there. Congratulations on making it to the end of the JavaScript section of this course. You've covered a huge amount. You've gone from pretty much zero knowledge of JavaScript to understanding how to make your JavaScript interact with your HTML, how to make your pages behave as you want them, and then how to create complex code structures using variables, arrays, loops, and if statements. In this video, we're going to put all of that together to make a great fun reaction tester. And this is how it's going to work. So we've got nice instructions at the top there, and all it's going to do is measure how long it takes for you to click on the box after it appears. So once I click there, that took me quite a long time. That was quite a bit quicker. And now we're keeping the speed pretty high. So you can see we've got a lot of randomness here. It's randomly positioned, it's randomly sized, it's randomly colored, and it's randomly a square or a circle. So there's a lot of randomness built in there. And there are a couple of new things that we haven't seen. So we haven't used timers before. We're using timers both to measure the length of time and to have a bit of a random delay before the next square or circle appears. So those two things are new and we haven't used random colors before either. But all three of those are pretty accessible with a quick Google. So I definitely recommend you have a good go at making this one yourself. As always though, if you have any problems, you can just watch me do it and see if you would have done it a different way. So I'll give you a minute now to pause the video and give it a shot. Best of luck. So I'm going to start off by keeping things fairly simple and I'm just going to have a simple red square which we'll then click on to make disappear. So much like our disappearing circles program from a few videos ago. So this should be pretty straightforward. I'm going to call it shape because I know that it's going to be a circle later on as well. And then in the head we'll have a bit of style with a type of text slash CSS and then we'll select our shape ID and we'll go for a width of 200 pixels and a height of 200 pixels and a background color of red. Okay, lovely. There we go. Next then is the challenge to make it so that when we click on it, it disappears. Shouldn't be too bad. So document dot get element by ID as we're used to. The ID is shape. And we want to add an on click and set it equal to a function. And what all we want that function to do is to make the shape disappear. And we do that using again document dot get element by ID shape. And hopefully you'll remember from an earlier video that we do style dot display and we set that equal to none. Okay, let's take a look. Hey, there we go. All right, now the main new thing, as I mentioned here, is the idea of a timer, which we haven't introduced, but let's see if we can have a Google and figure something out. So I'll go for something like JavaScript timer, JavaScript timing events. That looks promising and it's good old W3 schools as well. So we want to work out how long it takes before the user has tapped on the square. Now set timeout executes a function after waiting a specified number of milliseconds. We will need that actually later on when we want to make the square appear after a random period of time. But that's not what we need at the moment. At the moment, we need a timer to measure how long it takes. And I don't think this page is going to give me that. 
Okay, maybe I need to be a bit more detailed in my Googling. I'm going to leave that live though because we'll need it later on. Let's try JavaScript measure time, something like that. Measuring time taken for a function to execute. Okay, we don't quite want to measure how long it takes a function, but we do want to measure how much time has passed, and this is now looking very promising. So it looks like we can use the date.getTime function to get the current time, and then we can use it again later on to work out the difference. Fantastic. Okay, so let's try that out in our code. So I'll make it so that the time is first measured when the page is loaded. And then when we click, we want to get a new time. So we'll call this end. And we'll change these variables from var to let. And then, according to this code, we just subtract the two, and then that should give us the time that's passed in milliseconds. So we'll call this time taken, and that is end minus start. And then let's just do an alert for now. Alert time taken. All right, let's have a look. And actually we want to make it disappear straight away. So we'll do that before we do any alerting or anything else. Let's have a look. Okay, let's see, so if we click on there, so that's just under two seconds. If I do it quicker, we get a smaller number. Brilliant. So first off, bear in mind that this is in milliseconds. So let's divide it by a thousand to get the time in seconds. And let's also add a paragraph which is going to contain the time. We don't want it alerting every time. And the way I'll do that is with a span. I'll call it time taken. There we go. And it doesn't need to have any content initially. We're just going to fill it in here. So instead of alerting time taken, we're going to find the time taken by its ID. So get element by ID and time taken. So that will get the span. And then we want to set the inner HTML of that span to be time taken. And then we want to have an S to make it clear that this is seconds we're talking about. All right, let's take a look. So now, instead of alerting, it should display my time there. Brilliant. Okay, so now we've got our basic functionality in place. Our next challenge is to get our shape to appear after a certain number of seconds. So as it happens, the first Google link that I clicked on showed us how to do that. So this is the set timeout method. I always prefer looking at the examples rather than the kind of definition. I think they make it a bit clearer. And here, so we can use set timeout to run my function after three seconds or 3000 milliseconds. Fantastic, that's exactly what we want to do. And we know all about functions because we learned about them in the previous video. So let's set up our function first off. 
Don't know why I copied that really, I didn't need to. We could have typed that out ourselves, but we've got it now. So my function is a little bit vague. We want it to make shape appear. So we do this using document.getElementById. And once again, it's shape. And we set the display again, but this time not to none, but to a different option which will make it appear. Now, we haven't done that before, so we should just check. I think something like this. Okay, that one looks promising. Hide and reveal text and graphics. We already know how to hide it. We just need to make it display. And there we go. So style display is none. We've already used. So style display is block. That's what we need to make it display. So that essentially brings it back into the flow of the page again by giving it a display property of block. Okay, so that will make the shape appear. We also want to start the timer at that point. So what I'm gonna do is I'll define my start up there and then I'll update it when the shape appears. So this will run as soon as the page runs and because the start variable is defined out here and then the function is defined within that, we'll be able to use the start variable inside that function. So again, this is about scope Anything that's defined inside the function can't be used outside the function, but things that are defined outside the function can be used inside the function. I hope that makes sense. And then we just need a command to make the shape appear after, let's say, one second for the moment. And it looks like the command that we need for that is set timeout, and then the name of the function, and then the number of milliseconds. So let's do that here. So I don't want to run my function, I want to run make shape appear. And let's do it after a thousand milliseconds. All right, so hopefully that makes sense. If not, just go back and watch the last few seconds again because we did quite a lot of new stuff there. One thing I will need to change is I'll need to actually hide the square before we start, otherwise making it appear won't make any difference. All right. Let's take a look. So fingers crossed, the shape will now appear after one second. There we go. And it will then count the counter from when it appears. So this is the first time that the act reaction timer actually works. Let's see how quick I can get there. All right. So I'm happy with things, how things are going at the moment. Next, I'm going to make it so the amount of time that it takes for the square to appear is not fixed. So we've got a thousand here. So let's make it a random number instead. So I think we can pop that straight in here. We know how to create a random number. So this will create a random number between zero and one. We need to decide the maximum length of time that we want for this to appear. So we don't want it to be 10 minutes, otherwise the user is gonna get very bored. So let's say two seconds for now. So this will give a random number between zero and 2000, so up to two seconds. Let's just check that that works. Yep, looks promising. I think that was different to before. We'll have to wait and see. All right, so we're moving along pretty quickly here. We've got our random time. The main issue, of course, is that it only happens once and then the game is over, which isn't great. But that's actually really easy to fix because of the way that we've set up this function. So now all we need to do is when the user clicks on the shape 
is to run the function make shape appear again and then this will make the shape appear. One problem though is that that's going to do it immediately. So as soon as I click on it, it's going to reappear immediately. So there's two solutions to that. Either I could bring in the set timeout method here as well, or I could bring the set timeout method into the function. And hopefully, if you've been listening carefully to what I've been saying about functions, you'll want to do the second one because we avoid having the same code twice in our script if we possibly can. So it makes more sense, I think, to set up another function which I'll call, say, appear after delay. And then that's where we'll put our instruction to make the shape appear. And then instead of calling that directly, we'll have appear after delay there and also appear after delay inside our click code as well. So hopefully that makes more sense. If you can imagine an immediate benefit of that is that if we didn't do it that way, we'd have to have the set timeout method twice. So if we wanted to change the maximum from two seconds to five seconds, for example, then we'd have to change that in two places, which isn't a nice thing to have to do. So I think it makes more sense to keep it as it is. All right then, let's have a look. So we should get a bit of a delay. Okay, fantastic. That's working really well. Brilliant. So now we're going to make the game a little trickier by moving the square around. And as always, there's a few ways that you could do this, but I'm going to do it with positioning. So you'll remember, hopefully, that we, if we set our position to relative, then we can do things like setting the top to 100 pixels which will shift it down 100 pixels. And we can also set the left to say 200 pixels, which will shift it right, or give it a left margin of 200 pixels. So what we want to do is to introduce a element of randomness with the top and left. So we'll do that in the make shape appear. And you should be able to guess really how we do that with JavaScript. We get the shape in the usual way, and then we're affecting its style here. And we're affecting the top. And we're gonna set the top just before we introduce any randomness. Let's just set the top to 50 pixels. And then we'll just check, it should be down 50 pixels. Whoops, I forgot to type document there. Let's try that again. There we go. So we have moved it down a certain number of pixels using JavaScript. But we want that to be a random number. So let's get rid of our 50 and let's bring in a variable. I'll call it top. And this is going to be the number of pixels. And we want that to be a random number. So math random. And if that's 50 pixels, let's say up to a maximum of 400 pixels. And then we just use top plus and then px on the end to be clear that it's pixels that we want to move it. So now it should be in a random position vertically each time. There we go. 
Excellent. So now, it's just the same thing with left. So let's have a left, which is math.random times, let's go for 400 again. And then we want to do exactly the same thing. Get the shape element by its ID, and this time we'll set the style dot left, and that's going to be left, and then pixels on the end to give our units. So now it should be randomly positioned both vertically and horizontally. Brilliant. We're really getting there. Okay. While we're really into our randomness, I want to give it a random size as well. So let's give it a random width of, let's go up to 400 pixels. That's going to potentially let it be really small, but let's, let's see how that works out. And then once again, get the elements. And set its width. To width plus px, and I'll set the height to the same thing because I don't think we want sort of strange shaped boxes. I want to keep them all as squares. So let's see what effect that has. Yeah, I quite like that. I think that makes it interesting. Okay, 400 may be a little bit large. Let's go for 300. All right, so really it's now just a matter of refining the game a little bit. And one thing I definitely want is a random color generator. So this is again something we haven't done before. So let's see what we can get from a Google. Random color generator in JavaScript. That looks pretty good. Let's have a look. Okay, fantastic. So this looks like it does what we want. Let's just run through it and make sure that we understand what's going on. Okay. So what we have here is a string of the letters and numbers that make up our HTML color codes. And although the string isn't quite an array, it can act like one. So there's an indexer and we can access each of the characters that make up the HTML color code like an array. So what this is doing is taking the letters and numbers that make up our HTML color codes. So what we've got here is letters of 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and A, B, C, D, E, F. Then we've got our color string, which starts off with a hash, as HTML colors always do. And then we've got a for loop, which starts with i is equal to 0, goes on as long as i is less than 6 and increments i by one each time. And then, while well, we haven't seen this before, this is a way of appending to a string. So color plus equals means we take color as it is and we add to it letters. And this is now familiar to us as well. So we're getting a random number up to 16 and we're using math floor to effectively get a random integer or whole number between zero and 15. So essentially this is creating a random HTML color code. 
Brilliant. So we learned a couple of new tricks there, as well as got some code that will be useful for us. So let's add this function definition to our code. It's doing some nice automatic indenting for us there. The value of this letters variable isn't going to change, so we can make that a const. And we'll change these variables from var to let. Lovely. So now we've got our code in there. Let's change our background color. So document.get element by ID shape and then style. And where is it? Background color. Let's just see it all on one line. So we're going to want get random color. empty pair of parentheses because it doesn't need any variables passed to it. And that's it. So that should give us a random color each time as well. I should make i a let in this for loop. Hmm, something's not quite right. Aha! No parentheses. This shouldn't be a function call. There we go. Bit of purple. Pink. Bit of green. Fantastic. Bit of purple. Bit of grey. Okay, this is looking great. So there's actually only one more feature I want to add on the shape itself, and that is I want it occasionally to appear as a circle. So let's say we want it to be a circle 50% of the time. We can do that with an if statement, and we'll take, once again, good old math.random. And so if that's bigger than 0.5, then we'll make it a circle. We could have less than there as well, doesn't make any difference, but this will happen on average half the time. So to make it a circle, hopefully you remember, we get the element by its ID as before, and style, and what we want to do is set the border radius to be 50 percent. There we go. So that means it should be a circle 50 percent of the time. Two circles, four circles. So I think we're going to need a minimum size. I think that's a problem with our code. I it does appear to be a circle every time, which is unlikely. So let's have a look and see if something's gone wrong. Ah, yes. Can you see what the issue is? It's quite a good one. What it is is because it was a circle the first time we set the border radius to 50%, and then the border radius was set to 50% full stop. So even if it wasn't greater than 0.5 the second time, it was still a circle. So we need to add an instruction to say, if that's not the case, then set the border radius back to zero. Well done if you spotted that. So as before, border, radius, zero. Okay, let's have a look. So now we've got a square, 
and a circle and a square okay we definitely want to have a minimum size here so let's change the width to be a random number from 0 to 200 and then we'll add 100 to that and that effectively gives us a random number between 100 and 300 so it shouldn't get too small there we go brilliant so we're nearly done all I'm going to do is wrap it up a little bit, give it a nice font and a bit of a title at the top so it looks like more of a finished article. So that's pretty trivial in the scheme of things. But still, makes all the difference. H1, which says test your reactions. and a little bit of instruction so let's say click on the boxes and circles as quickly as you can and i'm going to use a neat sans serif font and we'll do that for everything so i'll use body and then we'll set the font family to I'll keep it simple and just choose sans serif. See how that looks? Okay, nice. I'd like a little bit more emphasis of your time down here. So let's make that bold. And we'll do that with a class of bold. So font weight is bold. And there we go. So let's have a look. That's working great. Fantastic. Hope you enjoyed that one. See if you can get a better time than me. And as always, there's a lot of ways you could extend this. So you might want to save the user's quickest time, for example. So it displays that constantly and then that gives them a challenge to beat it. You might want to show their average time or you might want to change the way the box displays. Completely up to you. But I hope you enjoyed that. And as always, I hope you managed to do a fair bit of it yourself. Or if not, that you realized after we completed it that yeah maybe i could have done more of that congratulations once again for getting pretty much to the end of this chapter we've just got one small video left and that's going to show you just like with css how we can store our javascript in a separate file using external javascript So if you can tear yourself away from our addictive reaction timer for just a few moments, I'd like to show you how we can separate our JavaScript from our HTML in just the same way that we did with styles. So let's first separate our styles to remind ourselves how we did that at the end of the previous section. We're going to create a new file and I'm going to call this style.css in the same folder as the javascript.html file. And then I'm just going to open up the javascript.html again to get the styles and cut. So command X or control X. So once I've taken those styles, I can put them into style.css. And then back in the HTML file, hopefully you'll remember that we create a link with a rel or relation of style sheet, a type 
of text slash CSS and an href or the hyperlink reference of style.css. And that's it. So if we just check that and run it, it should look exactly the same. Fantastic. Finally then, we're going to do the same thing with the JavaScript. So ignoring the script tags for the moment, just copy all of the JavaScript out and I'm going to cut that. So Command X or Control X on Windows and then I'm going to create a new file and I'm going to paste all of my JavaScript right in there. Okay, and then I'm going to save that as script.js. So the .js is of course the JavaScript extension, just like .css but for JavaScript. And then it's just a matter of getting rid of those script tags completely and replacing them with our JavaScript. Now in most cases you can put JavaScript at the head or at the end of an HTML document. I generally recommend doing it at the end, partly because all of your HTML elements will be in place by then, but also because it gives the chance for the browser to load the page before the JavaScript kicks in, which usually allows the user to start reading the instructions, or at least looking at something before the JavaScript has to finish. But there are a lot of other considerations as to where you put your JavaScript, which are beyond we need to discuss right now. So I'm just gonna pop it at the end, and we do this using script as before. And as before, we give it a type of text slash JavaScript. And this time, instead of an href, we give it an src, short for source, just like an image. And then we select our file, so script.js. And for script tags, we need to manually close them like that, unlike link tags. So let's have a look. That should work in exactly the same way as before, and it does indeed. So hopefully you can see that, especially if you're working with a big website, we've now got everything really nice and neat, and I've got all my JavaScript together in one file, I've got my styles together in another file, and I've got my HTML in a third file. So it's nice and neat, efficient for browsers if they're downloading a number of different pages on your site, and pretty straightforward to maintain as well. So once again, congratulations on making it to the end of the JavaScript section of the Complete Web Developer course. Go and grab a cup of tea and a biscuit, but don't take too long because we've got some jQuery to look at, and you'll be amazed at what we can achieve in just a few lines of jQuery. See you in the next section.